Good morning, Origins Church. We are glad that you are joining us this morning by video on this holiday weekend. And I pray that you had an opportunity to go out and spend some family time together. I know it's been warm outside Saturday well into the 90s. Today is going to be well in the 90s also, so get out and enjoy this time with your family and friends. The Fourth of July holiday, a special time. We celebrate the freedom of our country, the birthday of our country, and that's a good thing. The freedom that we can gather together to worship and praise God in our churches to lift his name on high. But it also reminds us of the freedom that we have to serve Christ. The freedom we have each day to let the light shine. And as we celebrate this weekend, let us celebrate the goodness that we have, knowing that Christ died for us, is preparing a place for us in heaven, and we can share that good news with all the people that we can come in contact with. It's easy to remain silent. It's easy not to offend anybody if I don't say anything. But I believe it's time for us as Christians to stand up for what we believe in, for what is true, to pray for a revival, to share the good news, and let others know that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior and God has good things planned for us as his children. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, as we come to you this morning, we seek you in your word. And we pray that as we study your word this morning that it may challenge us, encourage us to hate what is evil, to love what is good, Father, we have a hurting nation, a nation that is divided, a nation that is broken, a nation that is filled with concern, a nation that is filled with rage, but also, Father, I know that a nation that is filled with so much love. Father, help us as a church and as churches worldwide to stand up for truth, to stand up for good, to stand up and let the light of Jesus Christ shine. Father, let us be forgiving. Let us be caring. Let us be graceful in our talk. And let us really show what it means to love Jesus in our heart, but not only that, to love Jesus in our living. Father, bless us now as we celebrate this holiday weekend, the freedom that we have, and let us use that freedom to share the goodness of Christ. In your name we pray. Amen. I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 12, beginning at verse 9. Romans chapter 12, beginning at verse 9 through 13. Listen to God's word. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil and to cling and hang on to those things that are good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly and sisterly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord always. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in your prayer life. Share with God's people who are in need and practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Re rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with all people and do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it's mine to avenge and I will repay. Do not be overcome with evil but overcome evil with good. Here in Zerine, God's precious and holy word. This morning as I come to you, I need to share that I'm concerned for our country. 
In the years that I grew up, the 4th of July holiday was something to be celebrated with, with excitement and joy. Not only looking forward to the, the fireworks displays and family reunions and good food, but it was really a time to celebrate our nation. The goodness that God has shown to us over the years, that God has blessed our nation, that we become bold and strong, that we become a helper to other nations, an encourager and a welcomer to all people. But this is one of the first years where it's different. It breaks my heart to see riots, people mocking our nation, stepping on our flag, criticizing each other and tearing one another down. And I see so much hate. And I share with you this morning that hate is crushing us. It's crushing our nation and the lives around us. Hatred for people. How can that be? Hatred for one another. How can that be? I've even seen it in the church. Churches that are filled with anger. People who are intolerant, uncaring. And again, it just rips me up. And it destroys my spirit. Hatred and anger, pointing fingers, it can't be. So how do we change this? Matthew chapter 28, excuse me, chapter 20, verse 28 says, The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. If anyone proved their love for one another, it was God's Son, Jesus and when Jesus washed the feet of his disciples, he was showing not only that he loved them, but he was willing to show it in action. When he fed the multitudes and he taught them God's word, he was demonstrating God's love for them. And when he sat at the well and forgave the woman who was caught in adultery, when everyone else wanted to condemn her, Jesus demonstrated his love. Every time Jesus served or ministered or healed or preached, he was showing us something greater than himself, but the extent of God's love. And of course, we know his greatest demonstration of love, dying on the cross that sets us free. If we want to learn how to love people, it doesn't take much time to study the life of Christ and to see that maybe we all need a change of heart. To see how Christ handled different situations, how he cared for people, how he welcomed people, and how he forgave. To look at Jesus to see God's genuine love for this world. You know, this weekend we celebrate our freedom as a nation. Yet we celebrate the freedom that we have as God's children. The freedom that we have to share and to show this hurting and broken world what it means to truly live as Christ's children. What it truly means to be free. In Galatians chapter 5 verse 13 it says, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. That's what we're celebrating this weekend, our freedom. But do not use your freedom to indulge in sinful nature. But Paul says, rather serve one another in true love. So how do we do this? The scripture passage that we looked at this morning from Romans chapter 12, beginning of verse 9, is a great place to start. The first thing that we must do is love by hating evil. Hate what is evil and to cling to what is good. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. I think that's something that's missing in our society. Somehow we've gotten it all mixed up. We're starting to cling to the things that are evil. 
We tend to enjoy the things that are evil. Look at the TV shows that we watch. Look at the language that we use. Look at how we treat other people. It's like something that, hey, we have to be enjoying the things that are evil. Paul says, oh, we've got, we got to hate these things that, that God hates. You know, there's both good hatred and bad hatred in this world. And Paul says, hate what is evil. And if our hearts are really in tune with God and Jesus Christ, hate what is evil. In Matthew chapter 12, 34 and 35, it says, You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For out of the overflow of your heart, your mouth speaks. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him. But the evil man brings evil things out of the evil that is stored up in him. You see, we're storing evil into our lives. These are the things that we should get rid of to push away. Instead of agreeing with society and saying, okay, I guess that's what society thinks. I guess that's what society wants out of my life. We'll just accept it. But God says, hate what is evil. There's a lot of hate right now. Hate that breaks. But we're hating the wrong things. We hate people because of their skin color. We hate people from the countries that we think we dislike. We're taught to hate people because they're part of a, a different social economic system than we are. Because they may be richer than we are. So we're taught to hate them and dislike them. Or on the other side of the scale, we look at those who are, are below us and who do not have the means to care for themselves and somehow we're talking about we, we, we're not supposed to like those people. Rich versus poor, race issues, Republicans versus Democrats, we're taught not to like other people. And it creates all this dissatisfaction in our lives and hatred. And even in the churches. There's hatred. And it comes from the heart. Now listen, we're supposed to hate that which is evil and cling to what is good. We cannot hate people because of their skin color. We cannot hate people because they may be poorer than we are or richer than we are. Love them and care for people. Because these are people that have hopes and joys and dreams, just as you do. Hate what is evil. You know what I hate? I hate hearing about child abuse. How can an adult treat an innocent child in one of the things that I read in the newspaper or see in the news? How can a child be exploited sexually? How can a child be beat up because maybe they didn't do the right thing? That is what I hate. I hate people treating other people misfair, in, in, a, in an unfair way. These are things that, that are hate. Hate these things that are evil. Not people because of different skin color or wealth or poverty. Hate the bad things in life. You know, we need more good coming out of our heart. The good of Christ. Several years ago, on September 11, 2012, 52-year-old Chris Stevens, our U.S. ambassador to Libya, was brutally murdered at the consulate as he was attacked by Islamic terrorist. Now I know those are several years ago and things have gone on, but does something like that make you angry? Did 9-11 make you angry? When I see 30 or 40 or 50 people shot in Chicago, does that make you angry? hope it does. These are the things that we're called to hate. 
And there are so many things that are happening in our world today that should create us to be filled with anger. On December 14, 2012, was a day that I remember so well. Walking and hearing the news that 20 children ages 6 and 7 and 6 adults were killed by a crazy man at Sandy Hook Elementary School in Connecticut. I remember watching that news for the first time thinking, what in the world is going on here? How could a, a person do that to kids? This is the stuff that should create us to be angry. To have children starving in our nation should create us to have a, a, a feeling of just anger and hatred. To knowing that people are abused, spousal abuse, should create anger in us. It seems like those things are long past. Every week we hear about more and more murders. How can we not be angry at evil? And I talked about child abuse. Every year in our nation, 3.3 million reports of child abuse are made and that doesn't even cover all the kids that are abused because there were no reports. Six million children. Did you hear that? Six million children have been abused this past year in our nation. You know what? The United States has the worst record of child abuse of any other nation losing five kids every day to child-related abuse. We talk about the COVID. COVID, I believe, I think just recently, kids under 10 was just 400 kids, not even 400 kids, something like that. But every day, five kids are lost because of abuse. Approximately 80% of children die from abuse are under the age of four. I want you to think a minute. Every one of us here knows someone that's under the age of four. That bright smiling face. 80% of kids in child abuse die who are under four. Does that make you angry? I sure hope it does. Because Paul tells us in this morning's scripture passage to hate those things that are evil. We need to get worked up about these evil things and start thinking about how God can show love in our hearts. Don't hate law enforcement. There are some bad cops and there are a lot of good cops. Hate those who do it badly. Don't hate people because they come from the other side of the town. Hate the bad things that all people do. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. But what Paul says, hold on to those things that are good. Instead of watching the news over and over and Fox News and CNN and listening to the radio and talking to each other about all the bad things around us, let's start holding on to those things that are good. Because if we lose sight of the good things, it's only the bad things that will stick out. Celebrate a birthday with a little child. Find a kid in your church that, that you can just amaze them with some great birthday presents. Get a birthday cake for, for a kid in your church and just say, you know what, we're going to celebrate your life. Find an elderly member of the church and go visit them and say, what are things that, that stick out in your mind of those good things in your life. Listen to how they share about the past and how God has blessed them. Folks, we need to start looking at the good things and celebrating that and living that in our churches and in our communities. Hate what is evil and cling and share those things that are good. British statesman Sir Edmund Burke said this, all that is necessary for the triumph of evil is that good people do nothing. 
It's time for us as a church. It's time for us as individuals to start celebrating those things that are good and sharing the grace of Jesus Christ to a hurting and a broken world. Step number one, hate what is evil. Step number two, we love others by honoring others. Paul says in verse 10, Be devoted to one another in brotherly and sisterly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Let me ask you this morning, have you honored anybody lately? Have you honored anyone above yourself and lifted them high and said, I want to celebrate your life. You mean so much to me, or you mean so much to our church, or you mean something to our community. I want to celebrate you today. Look around. There are people that just want to have some good, to be lifted up and encouraged. An owner of a large department store offered a prize of $5,000 to the one that would give the best answer to this question. How can my business be most speedily and surely improved? He wanted to know how to improve his business. What can he do? And he sent out all these questions to universities around our country and said, tell me what I can do better. And students of these universities, they, they looked at this man's business. They, they looked at his books, his financial books. They studied his business. Students of economics, they, they went over lengthy talks of how can this business improve because they each one wanted to win that $5,000 prize. Roy McCardle was the one that received the check for $5,000. He's not an economist. He didn't have a, a business marketing degree. He doesn't even have a college degree. He received the $5,000 check because he simply wrote on a little postcard, tell your clerks to say thank you. That's all it took. Tell your clerks to say thank you. You know, we need to start caring for each other. Maybe it's a new resident in your neighborhood. How do you make them feel welcome? How do you make a new member feel welcome in your church? How do you help the kids that will be going to school this fall with all the uncertainty? How do you help other people? Church can send out postcards. They can send out news bulletins. They can rent a, or buy a, pay, a, a place in the newspaper and say, come to our church. But you know what that means, diddly. People go to a church because they're cared for. They're honored. I was reading this story. A year after living in our, our new community, his mother wrote, our 10-year-old son was diagnosed with leukemia. And she said, it tore apart our family. It broke our hearts. She said, it was amazing. Area businesses reached out, provided meals for us and gifts, and offered to take care of us wherever we need to care. She said, it was amazing that, that the superintendent of schools and the principal of my son's school reached out along with all the teachers saying, how can we help? What can we do for your son? The neighbors in our neighborhood, his mother wrote as she was breaking down in tears, they came to us and said, how do we help? But the church where we've been attending for the last 12 months, Remain quiet. That's a shame. How in the world can the church remain silent? And maybe that's the problem. The church has been silent for too many years, just letting the world direct its ways. The church needs to reach out to one another in brotherly love and honor one another above ourselves. 
Hate what is evil. Honor other people in your life. And the third thing is, live your life with excitement and zeal. Paul says in verse 11, Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in your prayer life. Let me ask you this morning, are you truly excited about your faith? Does it show in the way that you live and care for people? If someone would ask someone else that you see daily, what would they say about you? What's important about your life? Would they say, oh, he's, he's a great worker? Or she's a great mom? Oh, they're good people. Or would they say, you know what? It's his faith. Paul says, have zeal in your life and in your faith. Zeal in service. If nothing else, we can show that God is a God of love and care and compassion. And we can be a zealous church caring for those in our congregation, but also reaching out to those who are beyond our doors. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10 through 11, it says, Each one should use whatever gift that we have to serve others faithfully showing God's grace in various forms. If anyone has the gift to speak, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength that God provides, so that in all things God may be received the praise through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Do you get what Paul and Peter were saying here? Whatever we can do, whether it is to serve or teach or preach or wait on tables or clean or cook or, or pop the popcorn or make the coffee or clean the dishes, then we need to do it the best that we can. You know what, folks? We need to get more zeal and excitement in our faith and show it to a broken and a hurting world because we're living for Christ and His kingdom. Tonight, people are going to be celebrating and shooting off firecrackers and, and fireworks and Looking at our freedom, we have freedom in Christ. Let's get excited about that. Now, have you seen people at work? There are those that come to work and they steadily and efficiently get the work done in quality time. There are those that you may have to see that have to have a little extra push to get the work done. And then you see those people that come with a joy and spirit in their lives that God has given them the work of their hands and they're going to do it with joy. What's the difference? It's an attitude of Christ working in their heart. Do you live your faith with excitement? There are times I get down. There are times I hear about the news around me and, and I'm frustrated. I'm a new grandpa, by the way. And, you know, I always think, what's going to happen to that little guy in 40, 50, 60 years. What world will our world look like and what will the church look like? You know, we have to have excitement in our lives and in our church. Bible teacher F.B. Meyer once had a firewood factory that employed prisoners. And Meyer would give them a job to do and pay them good wages and a place to live. And when possible, he would always share his life of Christ with them. And in exchange, he expected them to work hard and, and give him good service. And when they didn't, he lost money for his factory. And it became kind of an attitude in his factory that they all became lazy. They were prisoners and they really didn't have to work and they didn't need to make the money and it was hurting his business. So he fired them all. He purchased a circular saw, and it was powered by a large gas engine. And in one hour, that saw would turn out more work than the combined efforts of all the men that used to work in his factory in one day. And one day, Meyer had a conversation with his saw. He was looking at the, the sharp teeth on that saw. And he said, how can you turn out so much work? Are you sharper than the saws that the other men were using? No. 
Is your blade shinier than the blades that the other men were using? No. What's better? Do you have better oil or lubrication against the wood? No. The saw's answer, if it could speak, would have been, there's a driving power behind me. Something that is working in me that's a lot more powerful than I am. It's the energy produced by that gas engine. There's something that's a lot more powerful behind us. And that's the power of Jesus Christ. The love of God. And is it shown in our lives? What's the power in your life? Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20 says, now to him is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is in work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Jesus Christ throughout all generations forever and ever. According to his power that is work in us. God gives us the strength, the power, the encouragement, the endurance to share his love. And when God's work is at work in us, we can do a great and mighty things. Paul says, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. And the last thing, we're called to love others by sharing the good news of Christ with these people. Share with God's people who are in need and practice hospitality. We need to help people. And there are people who are struggling within our congregation, within our community. Are we helping? Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 through 21 says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves a treasure that is in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break and steal. For where your treasure is, that's where your heart is also. You know, some people think that their life is about the things that they can acquire and the things that they have. And that's all they think about it, and they start to hoard it. They save it, and they don't want to share it. I laugh at these gold commercials that I see on TV because all they do is to encourage people to buy gold. Put it in a safe place. Treasure it. Because gold will never be destroyed. And it's always going to be worth something. So, so buy more gold. Let me tell you this story from Carson City, Nevada. Carson City, the rescue team was called to a home. The neighbors said they had not seen this man recently and they wondered where he was, so the rescue team went to this home and they found him in his home. And he had died six months earlier, quietly sitting in his chair. They checked his bank accounts and guess what? He only had $200 in a savings account. Everybody knew that he was just a poor man on the street that, that did not do very much. But as they went in to take care of Walter Samansko Jr.'s house, as it was being cleared for sale because nobody, there's no family members, no will written. So the city officials said we need to take care of his property and we need to get ready for sale. They discovered gold bars and coins in this home valued at over $7 million. Nobody ever knew that he was hoarding gold. The Carson City clerk recorder, Alan Glover, told the Las Vegas Sun adding that it was found stored in boxes in the house in the garage, hidden neatly that very few people could find. The 69-year-old man was found dead in his home from heart problems. They thought he was poor, but he was very wealthy. You see, he had lived in that house from the 1960s. His mother lived with him until her death in 1992. They also found out that this man had stock accounts of more than $165,000, $7 million in gold and $12,000 in cash. He left no will, no close relatives, and he was never able to share that money with anybody else other than the city who found it. What did that gold do for him? 
nothing. What did the wealth do for that man? Nothing. He just hoarded it for himself. I knew an elderly lady, and oh, she was old-fashioned. Go into her home, and uh, it looked like it came straight out of the 1950s. When everybody else was going with cordless phones and, and uh, other phones, that she still had the old dial phone, which would amaze kids today. The TV that she watched was, was old. It was in a cabinet, and it still had the big round screen to watch. If you turned it on, it would take several minutes for those old tubes to warm up and to start to have a color television. I'd love to visit with her. And one of the greatest things that she told me, I believe in giving to the living. I believe in doing my giving while I live. Isn't that great? I believe in giving to the living and I believe of giving while I'm living. And I knew this elderly lady in the community. She had a huge garden in her backyard and she would give flowers to the people of the community to brighten their day. She loved to make homemade bread and give it to people in her church. She made homemade soups and she brought it around town. She was always giving. Two different people. A man who died worth eight million dollars and gave to no one. And an elderly lady that died living to give. We can make this Fourth of July holiday in our nation greater if we live to give. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7 through 10, it says, The end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Above all else, love each other deeply. Because love covers a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. And each one of us should use the gifts that we have and serve others faithfully serving God in God's grace in various forms. Wake up, church. It's time for us to stand up for truth, for God's word, and to love and serve others. If God has given you money in the bank, share it, because that's true freedom. If he has given you the gift of grace, be graceful and share that to people that need to hear the good news. If he has given you the gift, go out and use it. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13 says, And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. When we see these protesters, it causes us to be angry. But do these protesters protest because we as a church have failed to show love? Are people angry and dissatisfied because the church has remained silent and we have failed to share Christ? And these people are looking for satisfaction in all the wrong places. Are children being abused and crushed because we as a church have remained silent and we push the kids to the side and have not taught young parents how to be true parents of God? Is there brokenness in our streets because we as a church have remained silent we have not cared for those who need to see and hear God's love firsthand from us. We celebrate our freedom on the 4th of July. 
but we need to celebrate our freedom as a church, as followers of Christ, to go out and do some amazing things and care for others. And if every church takes that commitment seriously, can you imagine the change in our world? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for all the, the joy that you've given to us in, in Jesus Christ. The freedom that you have given to us to worship and praise you in our churches this weekend. The freedom that you have given to us to live for you. And Father, may we take this call seriously to hate what is evil and to cling, what is, to, cling to what is good. To serve you with all grace and peace, with hospitality. Let us go out and show to a world what it means to live for you. Father, the church has been silent for long enough. We gather on Sunday mornings and Sunday evenings behind our stained glass and beautiful organs and sing the loud hymns. But when we walk out the doors, we go and live our life as if our faith hasn't meant much to us. Forgive us, Father. Allow us to be a church that goes and proclaims the love of Christ to reach out to others who are hurting and who are broken in this world that we may share Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior who is preparing a place for us. And Father, we all have failed. We all have sinned. Father, may we come to you with true forgiveness, saying that we're sorry and that you'll bless us and prepare a place in heaven for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Enjoy your holiday weekend. Be sure to let Christ be known in your living every day.